Hi everyone, it's Taryn. And Stella from Meeple University. Thanks for joining us. Today we'll be teaching you how to play Circadian's First Light, the second edition. After this video, you'll be ready to play the game. Stay tuned. Let's learn how to play Circadian's First Light, second edition. Game by S.J. McDonald and published by Garfield Games. If our video has been helpful to you, then please help us to make more by liking the video, subscribing and commenting below. For now, let's get to the table. In Circadian's First Light, players represent teams of the Circadian Explorers from Earth, each with their own unique leader, as they explore the newly discovered planet of Rai. Using dice that represent their crew, players will collect resources, explore the planet, build ships and farms, spend resources to complete contracts, and negotiate with the local clans for points. The player with the most points after seven rounds of play will win the game. In this video, we're showing you the second edition of the game. The main game plays under the same rules as the first edition with a few terminology changes, and there are some new leader cards that you can play with. There are also some updates to the game's artwork and a couple of variants you can play with. I won't take you through setup step by step, but I'll show you what the components are like when you'll be done. All of these boards and decks are the common area. All players will be interacting with them. The circular board represents the planet. In the centre of the board, each player will have a hexagonal harvester, which will represent how they move around the board. Resources able to be collected are placed based on what's shown at the tops of these hexes, and on the edge of the board will be six gem caches, each of which is worth a random number of points between four and eight. All remaining boards are places for worker placement. The negotiation board has these three clan markers in the top and these incident markers down in the bottom left. The six small squares are set up for different actions, and on the laboratory and foundry you'll have all of the farm and ship tiles in three piles ready to be purchased. And on the Depository Headquarters board, you'll have a deck of seven event cards, randomly chosen from all of those which come with the game, with the exception that the End of an Era event is always on the bottom of the deck. You'll flip one of these events each round, and this will track the rounds in the game. All boards are double-sided, and so you'll flip it to the side which represents your play account, and each location has a title and an icon which is referenced on other game components. Each player receives a research-based board, a player screen, which is used in the planning phase, and starting resources and dice. Dice represent workers, and the player begins with three, and the other ten are kept in a central supply. Each player is dealt three leader cards and chooses one to keep, and that leader may have some additional setup. Finally, players draft three starting contract cards. They're given a hand of four, choose one they wish to keep, and then hand the others to the player on the left. They'll receive three from the player on the right and choose another. Hand those on again, and then choose one more card from those received, discarding the fourth. Choose a first player, and you're now ready to play. Circadian's First Light is played in seven rounds, and the first step of each round is to draw an event card. This may have a positive effect, which is in place throughout the whole round, a negative effect for the round, or an immediate effect. Then all players simultaneously resolve the plan phase, and they'll do this behind their privacy screens, but I'll take the screen away for the purposes of the demonstration. First, players roll all of their current active dice. These are then placed in worker placement spaces on the research board, either in the garages along the top or the farms along the bottom. You can't place in the cantina. Dice placed in garages must be placed from left to right, and dice placed in farms can be placed anywhere. It doesn't matter whether you have a ship tile in the space under the garage or not. What you're doing here is planning your actions for the round. Each die that you place in a garage is ultimately going to be used for a worker placement action. 
Each die that you place in a farm is going to be held back and used to produce resources from that farm. Across your board you'll see a variety of resource costs and dice manipulation icons. But you do not resolve any of these in the planning phase. All of those will take effect when you later come to use that die later in the round. Once all players have finished planning, you'll move to the execute phase, and at this point the screens come down and all players can see each other's die choices. Players will now take turns, one at a time starting from the first player and going clockwise around the table, to make a die placement action. On a basic turn, you'll simply take your leftmost die, place it on a valid action space, which is any space which allows that number of die, and resolve the effect. If the die is above a ship which has a die manipulation effect, then this is the point you resolve it. Here for example, you could increase or decrease this die by one as you place it on the board. A six cannot wrap around to a one and vice versa. If a die is sent from a ship which has a discount showing in the corner, then whichever action you take will have this resource discount. And each ship you send after the first one has an algae cost which you must pay. So in order to spend this die you would have to spend one algae, but would get a 5 water discount on your final action. This icon cancels the algae cost of sending the die, not the cost of the action. If on your turn you can't afford the cost to send the die, or you otherwise don't want to take the action anymore, then that die and any others which follow it are moved to the cantina, and you gain two water for each of those dice. So now let's take a look at all of the different actions you can take in the game. The first location is the foundry, and with one die you can buy the top ship from the corresponding numbered stack. This costs either 2 energy or 10 water. Take the ship and place it in either your leftmost open ship slot or destroy a ship you already have and place it in that slot. The new effect is available immediately if you have a die in that slot. The laboratory is where you'll go to get new farms, but unlike the foundry you'll need to spend 2 dice instead of 1 and those dice must be equal in order to take the action. You'll place both dice on a single turn. It's the only occasion where you'll spend two dice instead of one on your turn. But remember that your dice have to be taken from left to right. This player would not be able to use the lab. But this one could, spending three algae at once to spend these two dice for the action. Then spend the cost, which is either three algae or ten water, to take the top farm from any one of the three piles. Again, placing it in your leftmost open farm slot, or alternatively destroying one of your existing farms to place the new one. This applies only to farm tiles, you can't cover your starting farms. Destroyed farms or ships are removed from the game, and in both cases if one of the draw decks ever empties, it simply reduces the choice for all future players. The third action space is the market, and this allows you to exchange one type of resource for another. The exchange rates are shown on the space of your die, and the total number of trades you can make is the number of your die. So on this turn this player could, for example, exchange 9 water for 4 algae and an energy. Next is the control room, and here you'll spend a die and spend 2 energy or 10 water to move your harvester one space around the planet. You must move in the direction showing on your die. So here you would move one step to the right. When you move your harvester, simply move it one step, and any number of harvesters can occupy a given space. If you land on a space containing resource tokens, then you collect those tokens. But for now, you don't gather the printed resources on the space. Those will come later in the harvest phase. If you move through one of these six arrows around the edge of the board, then you wrap around to the opposite side of the board, but otherwise you can't move off the confines of the board. Gem cache spaces function like any other space, and you'll simply leave your harvester there without flipping the tile. The fifth location is the mining camp, and this is one of the main places you can go to gain gems, which are the most valuable resource in the game. Place a die and then pay water, 
equal to the number shown here minus the number on the die. So here you would need 4 water to reach 6, while this placement needs 11 water to reach 16. Then gain the gem or gems as shown. The last of the six basic locations is the Academy, and here you can place a die and pay resources according to the die number in order to gain one or two new dice from the supply. New dice are placed at the bottom of the board, and you don't take an action with them until next round. As you'll recall, you receive three dice in setup, but you have a total of 13 available in your colour. Now this doesn't mean you'll eventually end up with 13 actions per round. In fact, the maximum number of dice to take into a round is 5. What you'll need to manage is that you don't get all of your dice back for actions at the end of each round. The next two actions we're going to look at, which are the depository and the negotiations, are major sources of your victory points, but are places from which you'll never get your dice back. First we'll look at the Depository, and this is where you go to fulfil contract cards from your hand. First place a die into an open matching numbered space. Then fulfil the contract, play it face up and pay the resources in the top left corner. Here it's 3 water and 4 algae. Most of the contracts you'll encounter will give you a small number of victory points, but they'll also give you an ongoing benefit, which makes one of the other actions in the game cheaper or more valuable. Here for example, any time you sent a die to the market, you would instantly get two algae ahead of doing your trades. Getting a good combination of these contract bonuses is a critical part of your engine building in the game, and it makes that starting draft for the right contract cards very important. There are also some higher cost contracts which give you end of game points based on achieving a certain objective, or just outright being worth a lot of points. But be warned, these spaces are limited. Once they've filled up, no one can complete any more contracts. Once you're done fulfilling the contract, you also gain the delivery bonus, which is this icon shown at the right of the row you placed in. This one lets you move your harvester one step in any direction on the map, this one gives you a new die to your supply, and this one allows you to draw two new contract cards. Next is negotiations, and here you'll be exchanging resources with the local clans for bonuses and points. First place any die into an open space, and pay the resources shown. In this case, six algae. If you have a contract card which gives you a bonus for negotiating with that clan, gain its bonus now. Then gain the once-off bonus printed at the bottom of that clan's tile. Here it's making up to three market trades. Then resolve advancements and setbacks, and this is based on what number die you place and what dice have previously been placed. If you're the first player to use that number of die on the negotiation board, then you achieve an advancement, because this is a new style of negotiation which is going well. Take the marker matching that number and move it over to an empty space on the right hand side, gaining the benefit shown. For example, a free farm, a free ship, a new die, a gem, and so on. Then check your columns specifically to see if you encounter a setback in your negotiations. This will occur if the total sum of all dice in that column meets or exceeds one of the numbers on these four or if you place a die which matches one already in that column. This red player's die placement could qualify for a total of three of these setbacks, some of at least eight, some of at least ten, and matching numbers. If you qualify for one or more setbacks that still has its incident marker, then choose exactly one setback from those choices, and place it into an open hole on the right hand side. You must now lose whichever resource you choose. So for example, two contract cards, one die from your supply, a gem, a ship, a farm, or in this case it would involve moving backward towards the centre of the map. If you can't pay the cost, then you can't choose that setback. Unless there are no options remaining that you can pay, in which case simply choose one of them to place the marker in, but don't suffer a penalty. The last location is Headquarters, 
And when you go here with any number of die, you can either draw two contract cards or gain five water. These are a relatively weak effect, however the real benefit of this space is it allows you to manipulate the next round's turn order. Suppose in round one these dice were placed. And then after the round two planning phase, the player boards were set up like this, with red as the first player, then purple, then blue. When it comes to resolving actions, before resolving any of these dice on the player board, you'll resolve the headquarters dice in their placed order. So the very first dice placement turn would be taken by blue. And as a bonus shown here, blue could flip this die over to its opposite side. Then purple would take the next turn with this die. Then purple again, then red, and then finally it would go to red, purple, blue in the normal turn order until all players were out of dice. If you wish to take the laboratory action, starting with one of the dice in the headquarters, then your next die, whether it's the next one you have in the headquarters or the next one in order on your player board, must be the second one you send. Once all players are out of dice in their garage, you'll move to the harvest phase, and here players will get an income of resources from two places. Firstly, their farms, and secondly, their harvester's location on the board. Here blue would get 3 energy and 6 algae, ignoring this gem here because this was the placement of a gem token during setup. As you can see, the number of resources that you'll gain increases dramatically as you move towards the outside of the board, and you can have flexibility on what type of resource by using the arrows to jump across the board. If you harvest on a gem cache, then the resources are a gem and a new die. If for whatever reason the gem caches are face up, then they produce nothing. When producing from your farms, a farm with a die placement space but no die does not produce, and a farm with no die placement space produces automatically. If in the planning phase you placed any die here, that allows you to increase the number of pips on each die to its right by up to three. Then each of these farms produces one type of the chosen resource, in the amount according to this table and the number on the die. In total, these farms produce 2 algae, 4 algae or 2 energy, and 6 water or 1 energy. Finally, it's time for the rest phase where you'll set up for the next round. Retrieve all of your dice from your farms, your cantina, and the small action boards, and add them to any dice that you gained during the round. Leave any dice on these two boards, the Depository Headquarters and Negotiations. Now resolve these two hand limits. If you have more than five dice, including dice in the Headquarters, but not anywhere else, then you must discard down to five, returning any excess to your supply from where you can gain them again later. Then if you're holding more than eight contract cards in hand, you must discard down to eight. Finally, rotate the first player marker one step clockwise. Now proceed to the next round. After seven rounds, the event's draw deck will be exhausted and the game is over. Now count up the final scores. Players get the points printed next to all of their dice on the negotiation board. By this time, the gem caches will have been revealed by an event, and players whose harvesters finish on one gain the points on the cache. Completed contracts score the points in the top right, and end game objectives on them score as well. On your ships and farms, you'll score points equal to the lowest printed value on your player board which is not covered, as well as points on any tiles that you've gained that have points. Finally, gain one point for each leftover gem. The player with the highest score wins. If tied, whoever has the most dice remaining in their supply breaks the tie. If still tied, most resources other than gems, and if still tied, victory is shared. Circadian's First Light has two gameplay variants. You can play the Dyad Alliance, in which each player will have two leaders instead of one. Players draft their starting leaders in turn order, starting from the first player, and then draft their second leaders in reverse turn order, finishing with the first player. To offset the benefit of having two special abilities, starting resources are dropped by 5 water and 2 algae. 
The second variant is the Irenic Union, and this version is a little bit easier to play because it takes away the requirement to spin your dice from left to right in the garages. You must still place them from left to right, but you have full choice of which dice to use when you take your turn, and this player could send both of these at once for the laboratory. And that's how to play Circadians First Light 2nd Edition. We hope you enjoyed this video, and do check out the project page for the game, we'll put a link to that in the description below. If you find this video useful, please help us by hitting that like button. Subscribe to us, you can also hit the meeple in the corner to do that, and hit the bell icon so you'll know when we have new videos. You can also follow me on Instagram for my board games journey. Comments, suggestions and feedback are all welcome in the comments section below. Thanks for watching and see you next time.